morning. This is week 13 of um, Introduction to Cultural Studies and uh, this is the last week. That's the end of the semester. So I thought it would be um, interesting to basically go back to the beginning. So we started from the discussion of the differences between nature and culture. And let's go back to nature. So let's see um, some aspects of, uh, of uh, cultivating nature, gardening and such things and uh, the way that culture responds to nature in the recent years. So um, animal studies and uh, Echo criticism and other uh, other uh, very modern, very recent uh, areas of cultural studies uh, that basically respond to nature. So let's look at the practice and cultural significance of gardening. Um, if you uh, if you remember, uh, actually the story of human civilization uh, starts with gardening. If you think about that, so the story of the Garden of Eden, one of the foundational mythical stories, uh, especially of uh, our part of the world, starts with the very first humans living in a splendid garden and cultivating the beautiful garden with all the plants and animals, uh, the entire nature living in peace um, before, of course, the, uh, the uh, humans um, started to interfere with it and they ate the forbidden fruit, so they were, uh, they were uh, cast out of the garden. Uh, the first Gardens are almost as old as humanity. Uh, we know of some famous prehistoric or very ancient gardens, for example, uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon in Mesopotamia, one of the wonders of the ancient world, not existent now, but uh, still remembered in culture. Uh, some of the earliest and most interesting gardens were um, were made in Persia. Uh, they were quite famous for the attempts to recreate this mythological uh, garden of paradise. So uh, first of all the importance of water in the garden, then the great um, value given to symmetry. Persian gardens are very symmetrical, even uh, even now, traditional Persian gardens. Uh, there were gardens in ancient Egypt, in Greece and Rome. Uh, each new epoch added new aspects to, uh, to the understanding and the functions of gardens. For example, uh, for example in, the medieval, in the medieval period, um, there were uh, mostly uh, practical gardens, usually monastic gardens, so uh, connected with, uh, uh, with the lives of uh, monks and nuns in monasteries. They were either used as vegetable garden, gardens or kitchen gardens, so um, producing edible plants or herbal medicinal gardens, that is, uh, the production of, uh, of healing plants for medicine. Uh, we have um, the first um, botanical gardens in Renaissance Italy. The earliest one was actually uh, in the 16th century in Padua. Uh, we have uh, the first public gardens in Spain and uh, this is, uh, uh, of course, uh, a part of culture that's uh, present all over the world, but uh, let's look perhaps at the specific uh, English uh, gardens and uh, the way that, uh, that gardens were used in British culture. Uh, actually, uh, Britain is sometimes uh, seen as a nation of passionate gardeners and uh, there are uh, some aspects of gardening that are 
particularly British, uh, like the national love of roses, especially uh, the type here called Austin roses, the, the typical you know, very full flowers with beautiful scent and uh, uh, they were made uh, by a very famous uh, gardener, um, David Austin. There is still the, uh, the um, production garden that, uh, that he established uh, earlier in the 20th century uh, and I think it's still run by his family. Uh, another British passion is allotments, so little gardens that were uh, given for um, the production usually of, uh, of uh, fruits and vegetables, but also sometimes um, decorative plants, uh, mostly to working class people, those who could not afford to have a residence with a private garden, these were li little um, plots of land that were uh, that were given to people. This is something that starts uh, already in the late 19th century and uh, and became especially popular um, during the war when it could be used uh, to grow extra food or uh, later just as a as a kind of pastime. So allotments uh, and uh, actually the BBC has uh, one of the longest uh, going programs actually it started in in 1968 uh, and it's still going called gardener's world very if you're interested in gardening this is something that uh, you might like uh, a very uh, well produced uh, program with lots of practical tips but also information about exotic plants, about uh, uh, practical uses of the garden, about history of gardening and other things. Uh, here we have the current uh, host of the program, Monty Don, but uh, as you can see uh, this uh, uh, program has been going on for a very long time so um, this is just a recent host and uh, um we can see uh, we can see his guest as well so um if we look at the history of english gardens it more or less follows the history of english art or english culture and all other aspects uh, but there are some interesting uh, elements that i would like to draw uh, your attention to first of all let's look at uh, historical examples the uh, the ones that still survive to some extent in the, in the unchanged form. So Tudor and Stuart Gardens, if you remember, Tudor means basically the 16th century and Stuart the 17th century uh, gardens. So here we have some uh, examples. Uh, what you have here in the, uh, in the photograph is actually an example of a knot garden. Uh, so decorative geometric patterns made of um, uh, of uh, hedges so uh, as you can see it's uh, uh, not really the flowers it's, it's not really the lawns uh, lawns uh, become fashionable later on because it was quite difficult to keep the grass short but uh, uh, one of the first types of decorative gardens were the knot gardens with those very intricate patterns they sometimes look like those um, those uh, uh, very ancient uh, celtic patterns really uh, made of hedges and walls uh, after the reformation gardens were sometimes used to convey secret catholic messages uh, through um, the symbolism of uh, triangles, like here we have um, a, a kind of garden house, uh, a decorative uh, um, house uh, in a in a private garden, which uses the uh, the the shape of a triangle. It's called the triangular lodge, uh, and uh, we know that the owners of the uh, of the residence were secretly keeping the Catholic faith after the Reformation. So uh, the triangle was meant to symbolize the Holy Trinity and there are quite a lot of um, religious symbols uh, in the decoration of this lodge. Labyrinths, again, were sometimes used to convey 
uh, secret messages. Uh, later in the, uh, in the 17th uh, century, um, we have the beginning of fashion, so formal Italian and French gardens, uh, which symbolize the control of nature. This is basically what gardening is all about, to control nature, to show the dominance of people over nature. There are some uh, some fashions that come and go, like there is this uh, huge, uh, um, rather short-lived but very passionate uh, fad for tulips. Um, it of course uh, comes from the Netherlands, but uh, it was also quite uh, quite visible in uh, in England. Uh, uh, lawns, as I said, become popular, uh, but only if you had sheep. To uh, eat the grass and keep it uh, short. And the um, first mechanical lawn mowers um, only appear much later. Also, topiary. Topiary is like the living sculptures made of uh, uh, of shrubs. So the shrubs that are uh, that are cut into um, all kinds of uh, sometimes very elaborate shapes uh, could be geometrical shapes but sometimes it could be figures of um, anything animals humans uh, uh, you name it uh, if you had a, um, a gardener who could achieve that with just some sort of gardening scissors uh, this was something very um, fashionable and definitely showing your class as uh, the owner of the garden. Then in the 18th century we have the Georgian period if you remember, so we have Georgian gardens. Uh, the most fashionable new type of garden was the English landscape garden. So rather than to have those formal geometric types of gardens that were borrowed from Italy or France, uh, there is the new native English fashion uh, of making a garden that looks like a beautiful landscape uh, and it looks as natural as you can. There are um, very famous garden designers. This, this is the first time we have famous garden designers such as Capability Brown or Humphrey Repton. Especially Capability Brown uh, was, um, was uh, very um, respected uh, as, uh, as a designer and uh, this is uh, um, some uh, this, this is this is basically the idea uh, of uh, what he would uh, design. So uh, beautiful hills and lakes, totally artificial, uh, looking quite uh, quite uh, naturalistic though, with uh, well uh, added small architecture, usually in the classicist style. So something that reminds of ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, buildings, small buildings like, uh, like um, lo uh, lodges or, or garden houses, grottos, statues. Uh, this is something that uh, really attracts the attention of, um, of the rich uh, landowners. Um, sheep are added, as I said, to cut the, uh, the uh, lawns, but also to add this element of, of the nature. Um, there are some interesting ideas like uh, the haha. The haha is uh, a kind of um, invisible border. So if you look at the, uh, at the garden, at the landscape, let's say from the, uh, from the residence, you just see an open landscape. But if you go uh, to explore, you find a hidden wall. So a wall hidden after a very delicate hill so that, so that you don't even notice the hill uh, looking from the, um, from the house, uh, but uh, it provides protection from uh, from the trespassers, from animals wandering into your land, uh, but it doesn't spoil the view, that's the idea. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution, uh, in the second half of the, uh, of the 18th century, uh, we have uh, basically more water features because of the um, extensive waterworks that were, uh, that were uh, made in, 
uh, in Britain, so canals and uh, all kinds of hydraulic um, uh, hydraulic uh, devices. Then we have the Victorian gardens in the 19th century, so basically two common themes, industry and empire. Industry using all kinds of new technologies such as uh, exotic plants uh, held in glass houses. Here we have um, an image of uh, the big Victorian glass house in Kew Gardens. Uh, if you remember uh, the great exhibition of 1851, the exhibition house called the, the Crystal Palace was also something looking like a giant glass house designed by a, an engineer and gardener, Joseph Paxton, who had a lot of experience with designing garden glass houses and then he built this um, unusual uh, exhibition space uh, that really embodies the Victorian age. So exotic plants uh, and uh, um, expeditions uh, by plant hunters uh, to uh, all corners of the world uh, to find uh, new attractive plants uh, for, uh, for English gardens. Uh, the growth of botanic gardens like Kew Gardens, very many cities start to have uh, botanic gardens, Edinburgh for example, plant collections uh, in botanic gardens, also private plant collections, uh, uh, magazines, this becomes really a passion, so uh, there is the whole industry uh, built around uh, gardening as a hobby uh, and also city parks for those who cannot uh, afford to have a private garden but uh, of course uh, it was uh, uh, understood that uh, contact with nature especially in cities in very large growing industrialized uh, cities would be very beneficial uh, for the people so first city parks open uh, what we have here is uh, um, a very victorian dish for displaying uh, a pineapple pineapples were sometimes seen as uh, a symbol of the age uh, uh, those who had uh, glass houses and very skillful gardeners uh, could actually boast of having their own fresh pineapples um, uh, in, uh, in their own gardens. Uh, they would be displayed for the guests. They would be eaten, of course, as a special delicacy, uh, sometimes especially in the out of season, like for Christmas. If you could have a pineapple for Christmas, you would even have a special dish for it, like here, uh, this um, uh, glass um, holder for uh, for a pineapple as a centerpiece um, now it's seen as a kind of um, uh, one of the symbols of the british uh, colonial expansion so it's a bit more uh, a bit more controversial but uh, by the victorians this was definitely something that they were very proud of and here we have one of the victorian um, illustrations uh, made by uh, by Marianne North, so this is the name of the of the woman who uh, who painted this uh, uh, beautiful image with um, with the, um, the passion fruit. So uh, here we have uh, an exotic plant, an exotic edible fruit with an attractive flower, uh, painted by uh, by a Victorian lady who would go to basically anywhere in the world to find new plants. Uh, then in the 20th century uh, we have um, some new trends like there is a massive trend uh, in the early years of the 20th century for cottage gardens so kind of uh, unassuming rural simple small gardens uh, uh, the um, designer uh, associated with this fashion was Gertrude Jekyll and here we have uh, uh, a typical cottage garden here on this uh, color photograph so a small house with a small um, 
garden using mostly native plants, uh, rural plants, nothing too mm -hmm. fancy, nothing brought from the empire, but rather native, uh, native plants. Uh, gardening becomes a very fashionable hobby for the intellectual circles, for the artistic circles. If you remember the Bloomsbury group, um, the um, artistic and uh, social circle uh, whose most famous member was Virginia Woolf. They loved gardening. They uh, usually, these were very rich people. They had their own private residences and some of them were very keen gardeners, especially um, Another uh, woman, uh, Vita Sackville West, uh, a writer and uh, socialite, uh, she and her husband uh, had a beautiful garden in Kent called Sissinghurst, uh, which they, uh, they cultivated and designed themselves. Uh, during the war, uh, of course, food production was uh, most important. So we have the allotments, uh, which I already mentioned, but also the so-called Victory Gardens, and this is the uh, black and white photograph, uh, taken in central London, where uh, any free space was used to grow vegetables. Basically, this was, these were called Victory Gardens, these were like inner city um, production gardens, kitchen gardens, with uh, usually um, simple vegetables like potatoes or carrots or, or something that could add to the uh, to the quality of the food eaten by um, by the British. Uh, after the Second World War in the second half of the 20th century and nowadays, uh, we have basically the globalization, the mass market uh, for plants, the mass production, everything goes huge and uh, corporate and global. I would say one of the recent trends uh, now in uh, British gardening is uh, uh, rooftop gardens in big cities, in London and other big cities. Uh, usually the um, office uh, towers, uh, they had flat roofs and uh, now these roofs are more often used for some sort of little fancy city gardens. So uh, that's uh, the short overview of, uh, of the history of gardening and the way I hope you can see that gardening reflects the culture in basically all historical, uh, historical uh, epochs. Let's now look at the way that uh, culture and cultural studies use this history. So what can be deduced, what can be studied more, um, more specifically. For example, if we look at the Georgian period, if we look at the 18th century, there is a very interesting connection between women and the study of botany. So um, the 18th century, the 19th century, we have uh, the um, connection between women and flowers. It could be seen as part of female accomplishments, that is the kind of skills and hobbies that, uh, that uh, rich ladies were taught usually um, when, they were, uh, when they were young. So for example, drawing or, uh, or embroidery, uh, very often using floral patterns. Uh, also, this could have uh, a certain connection with science. So it could be used for uh, botanical illustration. Uh, you met Marianne North, um, she was a very famous 19th century uh, botanical illustrator traveling to remote locations to paint the plants in their natural habitats. This was a very new thing and not many um, Victorians did that. But she was definitely not the first one. In the 18th century, there are researchers and illustrators, uh, uh, especially after uh, the Linnean system of classification of plants um, is, uh, is made uh, popular, so the new system of basically classifying plants according to their 
um, to their um, sexual organs. This was quite naughty uh, for some and the way that so many women got interested in plants and started looking at their sexual organs and classifying them. This was seen as something uh, quite scandalous by some moralists. Uh, um, but uh, this is uh, something that, that was immensely popular. Here we have another um, talented woman, Mary Delaney. As you can see, her, uh, her uh, years of life uh, are fully in the 18th century. And uh, this is one of the illustrations that she made, uh, but it's not a drawing. It's actually paper. This is something that she called paper mosaics. So paper cutouts uh, of colored papers glued to a black um, background to show a very elaborate plant. So this is this is quite incredible, and uh, our, um, there's been quite a lot of discussions whether or not it's uh, it's uh, a full blown art or just a version of a female accomplishment. But uh, then again, it's uh, it's quite um, quite fascinating. Uh, so we have this connection between women and botany. Uh, then we have this concept of the rural idyll, uh, going straight back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his idea of return to nature. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of um, discussions, philosophical discussions. What is gardening? Is gardening nature or culture? It seems like something in between, something that is, of course, using nature and plants and uh, and the outdoors, but influenced by the human hand to create a desired effect. Uh, especially in the 19th century, but uh, also in the 20th century, um, the rural idol really becomes the expression of nostalgia for the pre-industrial world also the expression of patriotism and uh, this is uh, this is quite visible in two examples here uh, and uh, i think we'll talk about them in a moment so two examples of the cultural uses of the rural idol the first one is to promote patriotism and uh, the print, the illustration that you have here uh, below, is actually one of the war posters that were uh, made uh, before the Second World War, uh, using precisely that, images of beautiful English landscapes. There, there was a whole uh, series of, I think, six different, what's on, six different uh, images. Um, showing different areas of England, uh, but uh, the, the caption was, was always the same. Your Britain, fight for it now. So uh, the purpose of these posters was to encourage men to join the army and take part in the war um, and convince them that this is the country they love this is what it looks like and it's now threatened and needs to be protected. Uh, an interesting thing is that um, for most men who joined the army, who saw these posters, this was not uh, the kind of landscape that they were most used to because uh, by that time, by uh, the um, by the uh, middle of, uh, of the 20th century, Britain was absolutely one of the most urbanized countries in the world. So this rural, rural idyll with uh, shepherds and sheep and, uh, and uh, uh, little villages, um, this was something of the past. This was a nostalgic use of the past, uh, but it was still very effective. Then, towards the end of the 20th century, there is a massive wave of interest in what is called heritage movies. Here you have one example, Howard's End, but uh, there were very many similar films uh, made uh, by British producers with British actors, sometimes uh, based on literary sources like Howard's End. Uh, but, uh, Every time they were set in the past, not 
very distant past, but like the 19th century, and they show the very nostalgic view of um, of the rural life, of the life of the country gentlemen, of the nobility. Uh, if you watched uh, Downton Abbey, this is this is more or less in the same vein, but these were usually um, feature films rather than uh, than TV series. But uh, Downton Abbey was definitely inspired um, by the heritage movies. Uh, of course, uh, it's been criticised uh, for showing the uh, the um, unrealistic image of the past, for showing the past that was uh, very um, focused on social class. So there are usually the masters and the servants, and everybody knows their place. There is a very strict hierarchy of classes, of genders, uh, sometimes even of races, uh, because of course in the 19th century Britain was at the height of the imperial expansion. Uh, but this is also the way to use the rural idle so to use the beautiful country residences and beautiful landscapes to promote the view of the past so some more uh, some more uh, cultural subjects connected with nature for example tourism as you can see some uh, statistics uh, uh, around the uh, the time of the outbreak of the uh, of the second world war one million people traveled abroad now, or at the turn of the century, uh, it was uh, 650 million people a year. So uh, quite a lot. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, becomes much more available and much more democratic hobby and anyone uh, who has even a, a little money uh, and some free time can now think of um, of going abroad for their holidays. The holidays themselves are the invention of the 19th century if you think about that. So from the very beginning when tourism becomes popular, so late 19th century we have the first travel agencies and uh, the first attempts to uh, to interest the middle class in in uh, um, foreign trips and generally in traveling, there is this uh, um, this um, contrast, the juxtaposition between tourism and travel. So um, travel is something very positive. You have the quote from Mark Twain here. Uh, Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow-mindedness. So it broadens your mind, it makes you more tolerant, it makes you more uh, understanding towards other cultures and other ways of life. Um, this was something very uh, fashionable ever since the 18th century when the uh, the concept of the Grand Tour appeared. The Grand Tour was a special kind of travel for young people, mostly men, later also um, young women, from noble families uh, who completed their formal education, so usually they completed university, and then they went on the Grand Tour of Europe mostly. Sometimes they would travel farther, they would travel to the um, to the Middle East, they would travel to Egypt, they would travel to Constantinople and, and sometimes even further away. But the idea was that uh, um, a cultural trip of Europe, mostly Italy, Greece, France of course, uh, would be the completion of education because a young person could see the uh, masterpieces of art and uh, the places connected with great artistic movements such as the Renaissance. Tourism was dismissed as stereotypical and inauthentic and uh, it is still sometimes criticized as such, especially uh, mass tourism, mass organized tourism, so uh, all these um, uh, trips that are uh, that are um, designed and sold by uh, by companies that specialize in that. Uh, it is sometimes uh, criticized as uh, um, troublesome and uh, unpleasant for people actually living there. So here we have. 
uh, uh, graffiti um, that condemns tourists, uh, especially on those large cruiser ships, uh, for damaging local way of life and uh, and uh, uh, making it uh, very hard for people to actually live in attractive places, especially Venice, for example. Um, westernization of the um, foreign countries, especially the f countries that were supposed to be exotic, like I know somewhere in the in the Far East, like uh, like for example, uh, Thailand. Uh, and also something that's quite interesting, um, it's sometimes called coca colonization. So it's the, uh, the combination of colonization and Coca-Cola. So the way that uh, uh, native people, native cultures um, are lured or, or kind of enticed to accept some elements of, uh, of uh, Western culture, uh, but also those that uh, make them consumers of mass-produced goods. So, um, quite a uh, quite a problematic aspect of tourism as well. Uh, another way of uh, looking at nature and uh, the environment is uh, through the concept of non-places. This was uh, um, originated by a, a cultural scholar, Marc Auger, in the 90s. He, uh, he wrote a book called Non Places Introduction to the Anthropology of Supermodernity. So, supermodernity means the globalized world, the globalized world which creates sp uh, spaces um, where the concerns of history, relations and identity are erased. So these are places which are basically the same everywhere, such as airports, stations, supermarkets, uh, motorways, uh, chain hotels. These are the places that are uh, identical, that are globalized, that are uh, usually part of um, the corporate uh, world, so they are operated by huge multinational companies uh, and uh, nobody remembers them because if you travel somewhere you don't really look at the uh, airports or, uh, or motorways or, or even hotels unless they are, uh, they are deliberately designed to be characteristic. Um, and what these non-places have in common is something very interesting for the modern scholars of culture, that is their liminality. Liminality is um, a concept that comes from a Latin word meaning a threshold, so a border, a barrier between two things, two states. So it's the middle stage, the in-betweenness causing confusion and disorientation in the people. Um, the next way of looking at nature through the lens of culture is the practice of keeping pets. Actually, where are the cats? <laughs> Give me a cat. <laughs> so, um, the practice of keeping pets. Let's wait for a moment. So, the practice of keeping pets, and here we have Two cats, we have Watson and Minnie and there should be somewhere two more but they didn't like to pose so okay you're free, you're free to go and uh, why do people keep pets and what is the cultural significance of this practice? So, uh, if we look at the history of pet keeping, and generally animal keeping, working animals were ubiquitous in um, the historical reality. Uh, they were everywhere, horses and uh, animals that were grown for food and dogs used as shepherd dogs and protection dogs and cats used for 
catching um, vermin uh, and so on, but companion animals were kept only by the aristocracy. It was a status symbol. If you could have an animal that uh, you just kept for the pleasure of their company rather than for any practical reasons. So um, from the Industrial Revolution, the middle class start to uh, imitate the, uh, the um, practices of the upper classes. So they develop a fashion for keeping pets. And by the Victorian period, by the 19th century, the middle class um, really start keeping pets as a, as a very common practice. Why um, this was a status symbol again, but uh, it's also connected with uh, the urbanization, the way that the urban style of life uh, developed and people uh, people uh, living in cities uh, uh, didn't have so much contact with animals as before and many of them wanted that. So if they wanted to have animals in their life, they would have to keep pets. Also, new patterns of leisure. So people had, uh, had more time and uh, more um, money to spend on their, uh, on their um, pleasures. Uh, very often uh, this would develop into a full-blown hobby with um, everything such as the dog shows that start in uh, in 1859 so breeding animals for some specific purposes for some desired characteristics uh, and uh, the idea of pedigree the idea of um, of um, competition who has the uh, better dog and uh, uh, also cat uh, later on uh, this becomes quite popular as well um, as you can see here uh, th this is an 18th century portrait of a girl with a doggy and uh, here we have a late 19th century photograph of Queen Victoria herself with one of her pet dogs. She was a, a great lover of animals and especially dogs and she had uh, very many favorites. This is one of the uh, of the dogs she kept uh, in later life. Uh, if we look at the statistics um, actually um, right now uh, something like a quarter more than a quarter uh, of uh, British households have cats, 31% have dogs in uh, uh, the USA it's even more with 38% uh, of households having cats and almost half of the household having dogs so definitely uh, there is a, a great popularity of keeping pets mostly cats and dogs but uh, other pets as well fish uh, small mammals birds reptiles and amphibians horses also horses kept as uh, companion animals or uh, animals for um, riding rather than uh, working animals. Uh, this uh, of course attracted the, uh, the interest of scholars so we have full-blown animal studies which deal with uh, such subjects as uh, the history and practice and, uh, and uh, development of animal rights the suppression of cruel sports, which used to be uh, unfortunately popular, such as bullfighting or, or dog fighting uh, or um, even bear fighting, uh, that was still quite popular uh, in Britain at the beginning of the 19th century. Not the bears, there were many bears, but bullfighting and dog fighting and cock fighting, of course. And happily, they were uh, they were outlawed um, during the uh, the nineteenth century. Uh, other things, uh, environmentalism, so the protection of the natural environment, not only animals but the, generally the the environment. Humanitarianism, so the movement against cruelty to animals, but 
other uh, aspects of reducing cruelty as well uh, and the concept of anthropomorphization of animals uh, so presenting animals as uh, creatures uh, very similar to humans. You'll see uh, some examples in a little moment. So here we have some uh, very short uh, um, outline of the fight against animal cruelty in Britain. So as you can see uh, it happens throughout the 19th century with uh, uh, new acts of parliament proposed against cruelty to animals. Actually uh, it's quite interesting to notice that the first animals protected by the law were not cats and dogs but cattle. So the animals that were bred that were um, bred for uh, for meat, for for food, for basically um, human uh, human um, um, use. But uh, the idea was that they shouldn't be treated treated uh, with cruelty. Uh, in 1824, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals is established, still quite a venerable institution. Uh, then uh, uh, several uh, acts um, outlaw the cruel sports, and uh, uh, then. Um, the Vegetarian Society in the UK is established, so they promote certain behaviours such as abstention from eating meat and uh, um, uh, present it as, uh, as a moral thing, as a um, humanitarian thing as well. Uh, then uh, towards the end of the 19th century we have the legislation against the abuse of animals for science, especially, uh, as you can see here, the National Anti-Vivisection Society, so against any kind of medical uh, medical uh, experiment made on live animals uh, uh, rather than, uh, than um, animals that are I know, dead already. So, um, uh, here you have a, a little um, monument from London uh, commemorating the so-called brown dog affair which was a massive protest against cruelty to animals in the scientific laboratories. So actually some activists discovered that, uh, um, that uh, scientists were um, con conducting uh, cruel experiments, painful experiments on some dog and this led to a massive riot and uh, further um, legislation and uh, this whole affair was, uh, was commemorated by this uh, lovely um, a monument in one of the uh, parks in London. Uh, what is anthropomorphization? This is this is the way of uh, showing animals as uh, possessing human emotions or human traits of character. It could be human vices as well. Uh, so uh, quite popular in the 19th century when humanitarianism was uh, conveyed through actually making people aware that animals have emotions and, uh, and they suffer, they can suffer the same way as, uh, as humans, that uh, also the animals uh, can have very strong emotional connection to other animals and to people. So here we have some books like uh, um, a book by Anna Sewell, Black Beauty, about uh, a horse. So you can see the uh, modern cover of uh, of the book with the beautiful horse on uh, on the cover. And here we have uh, uh, a book by Virginia Woolf, so one of the Bloomsbury group members, uh, being a biography of her doggy, Flush as you can see here, a photograph of the dog on the cover. Um, also very popular thing in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, all kinds of um, images such as Christmas cards and, uh, and other um, comical uh, images of showing animals dressed up in human clothes and uh, behaving uh, just like humans. Uh, another thing which is quite uh, popular in the late 19th century, but I say it's more uh, controversial for the modern audience, is the immense popularity of taxidermy. That is uh, um, actual 
bodies of animals uh, that are preserved and uh, very often uh, designed and, and uh, made into some sort of uh, tableaus, so they uh, present human behavior, they are sometimes uh, are dressed in human-like clothing. Uh, there were some people who were quite famous for it, uh, one, uh, one uh, creator of uh, taxidermic tableaus was called Walter Potter and this is one of his uh, one of his um, tableaus showing a school uh, with some small animals uh, I think these are small rabbits um, again the Victorians and Edwardians didn't find it shocking uh, for the modern audience I wouldn't really say it's uh, sweet and uh, and humanitarian, even though of course probably these animals would be uh, killed anyway and not even commemorated in the uh, in the form of taxidermy. But it's quite problematic, and it really shows you the difference in the treatment in the humanitarian treatment of animals and kind of. Um, uh, inspiring humanitarian treatment of animals in people back in the 19th century and nowadays. Um, to compare it with the, uh, with the uh, contemporary views, uh, here we have one philosopher, Peter Singer. Uh, he is one of the postmodern philosophers. He is very much inspired by the work of Jacques Derrida. Uh, and uh, uh, his main area of interest is animal studies and basically the uh, philosophical meaning of uh, the presence of animals in, the, in modern human dominated society. Uh, in 1975 he uh, wrote a very influential book called Animal Liberation in which he asked several questions which I think still have not been answered fully. So of course um, it's been known at least since uh, uh, since um, the 19th century, since the 18th century, the Enlightenment really, that animals experience suffering. Uh, this uh, um, is visible in the works of uh, such philosophers, for example, as Jeremy Bentham. Uh, so um, it's nothing new, but for example, should they have the same rights of protection as humans? If animals are living creatures and if they can suffer, which has been established, do they have the same rights of protection? Uh, is it even ethical to keep pets? So uh, is poor Watson my slave? Are you my slave, Watson? I don't think he is. I don't think he is. But what of the animals that are um, that are kept in cages, the, I don't know, fish that are kept in aquarium and uh, um, dogs that are constantly kept on leash, are they slaves? Is it even ethical to, um, to keep animals? Does it serve them uh, or does it only satisfy our selfish human needs to be loved by a creature of another species? Should everyone become vegan? Is it ethical to eat meat? Is it ethical to give meat to your pets? I would say the most extreme um, proponents of this theory um, design vegan food for cats, which I think is not good really, but um, should everyone become vegan? Should animals be used for medical tests at all, even if it doesn't bring additional cruelty, uh, is it ethical to use animals in such a way? Um, so uh, if we agree that animals are living creatures that feel pain and that they have emotional life and, uh, uh, and all, should they be treated as um, individuals? Should, we, should they be treated in the same way as humans? Of course, uh, I would say the jury is out. This is one of those uh, current questions that are not yet um, resolved, but uh, definitely this is something that uh, that is uh, an interesting um, philosophical proposition. Uh, three more 
slides, so three more ways of looking at nature through the cultural lens. Uh, so the next one is eco-criticism, so the interdisciplinary study of literature and the environment. So first of all we have the representations of nature in the arts throughout the history of art. So uh, here we have Shakespeare uh, presented in this kind of um, natural uh, way. But if we, if we look at some uh, works by Shakespeare, especially The Tempest, there is this image of an island, a special little ecosystem that is uh, uh, disrupted by uh, the magician Prospero and, uh, and uh, subdued. So it's like nature being subdued by humans. If you look for such representations, you can find them in any uh, period of, uh, of literature. Uh, so uh, what uh, could be observed? Uh, for example, uh, anthropocentrism present in most of these especially earlier representations. So the belief that humans are the most important creatures and as such they either have the right to subdue nature or, or they have the moral obligation to protect nature. But it's all seen uh, with the uh, perspective that, uh, that humans are the most important. Or Cultural ecology, the study of human adaptations to social and physical environment. Uh, this can be seen in history, in uh, social behavior, but also in artistic representations, the way that humans interacted and adapted um, to the changing environment. Uh, two more things. The next one is post-industrialism. So something that according to some uh, scholars and uh, intellectuals could liberate nature from the uh, human oppression. So here we have, uh, mostly in the 70s, in the 1970s, there was this movement, um, a rather um, utopian movement uh, by some uh, scholars such as uh, Alan Turing or Daniel Bell, um, the, the dream basically of the post-industrial society. Uh, the post-industrial society was to be uh, fully mechanized, so the production of everything, the, the manufacture of, of anything would be fully um, robotic and, uh, and mechanized and the replacement of manufacturing by services. So what would people continue doing are the creative things and the services. So uh, the dream of post-industrialism was, uh, of post was uh, that uh, there would be no working class because there would be no work in the traditional sense as manufacture. The only work available or, or remaining would be creative work or the work in services, so um, with other humans, but not the kind of factory work or other uh, repetitive and hard physical um, labors. So uh, what they believed is uh, it's coming, it's the next step of industrialization and we'll have the information-based society so everybody would be just um, just creative and uh, using their computers and uh, robots would uh, do everything. Uh, the question is, is it, an, is it, is it a utopia? Uh, is it ever going to happen? Is it possible to have something like that? Uh, actually, uh, the uh, reality of economy in the uh, in the 70s and later and and basically uh, the modern world um, seems to be proving it's not possible uh, because uh, people are still working sometimes very hard and sometimes in rather uh, cruel conditions to manufacture things for example one of those uh, um, ways that uh, post-industrialism did not happen is uh, the outsourcing so the production has moved somewhere else uh, very often uh, especially towards the end of the 20th century it was moved to the far east so uh, you have all these uh, great uh, factories of producing cheap goods like 
clothes or, or plastic goods somewhere in the Far East, in China, in uh, uh, Bangladesh or, or, or such countries that have very uh, cheap um, cost of labor. So very often the, the rights of the workers are not protected, so they can uh, be used almost as slaves. Uh, where is post-industrialism uh, here? Also, the um, observation that uh, very many um, immigrants were coming to, uh, to Western Europe uh, in search of work, such as the Gastarbeiters in West Germany uh, in the 50s and the 50s to 70s mostly. So there were lots of people coming mostly from the Middle East from Turkey and other uh, countries in the region uh, to places like uh, West Germany, so this more industrialized, richer part of, um, of Germany before the unification, looking for jobs. And what they were finding was basically um, jobs in, uh, in uh, industrial production. So uh, at least uh, as far as we can see, um, we have not reached the time of post-industrialism and uh, it's quite debatable whether we will um, ever do that. So post-humanism, the last thing, the philosophical post-humanism is basically expanding the circle of moral concern and extending subjectivities between, uh, beyond the human species. So this is something that Peter Singer uh, initiated and, uh, and uh, contemporary scholars um, have been uh, concerned about. So again, uh, subjectivity, the individual um, consciousness, the individual perception, is it only human? Do animals have individualities? Um, if you look at the cats, if I look at my cat, they have very different personalities and I think they have subjectivity. There is cat number three somewhere here um, and she is very shy, so she has a completely different personality. She doesn't want to pose, coach, kichunchi, coach. No, no, no. Um, so, um, Watson, Watson loves to post and Mimi is very curious and uh, there is another little cat but in the second house so he's small. He doesn't 